Hello. What I want to try and talk about in the next few minutes now is what evidence-based practice means and how it's relevant to human resource management. Evidence-based practice is really designed to fix a problem which is regarded as quite a big problem that affects all professions and all practitioners. Everybody uses evidence in their practice. We all use evidence, information of different kinds when we come to make decisions as a professional. However, there's a couple of problems with that. The first problem is we tend to not use enough different sources of evidence. For example, we might rely just on our own experience or we might rely just on a particular idea or piece of research. So we don't look right across different sources of evidence. The second problem is we don't critically appraise the quality of that evidence and that's an essential part of evidence-based practice where rather than just saying here is some information, we should always ask can I trust this? How reliable is it? In the end, all information evidence has problems, has weaknesses, has limitations, and it's part of the job of an evidence-based practitioner to try and identify those and to think how trustworthy, how much should I really use this information I've got. So evidence-based practice is an idea that is a thing. It's a thing that now has spread across many different professions. It started around maybe 25 years ago in medicine and what happened in medicine it was originally developed as a teaching method there was a view that the way in which medical practitioners were taught was quite poor and that they weren't being given good quality scientific evidence about the problems they were dealing with and indeed around that time in the early 90s some people felt that perhaps only 18 to 20 percent of all medical interventions were actually based on solid medical evidence what that means is, in fact, that a lot of what medical practitioners were doing could be either harming patients in some, some way or just not really achieving very much. Or possibly it did work, but they didn't know. And it kind of started a revolution within the medical profession. Since then, lots of other professions have adopted this as a model of a way of thinking about how you incorporate better quality evidence into your decision making. This goes from policing to social work to educators to conservationists to policy makers and perhaps most recently to management and to human resource management. So it really is a thing, it's a way of thinking about how you make decisions. So what actually is evidence-based practice in the context of HR? There are kind of six steps to thinking about doing evidence-based practice. The first step is you ask a question. You say what is going on here, what is happening, what is the problem? The second step is that you acquire and pull together information that's going to help you answer that question. The third is that you critically appraise, going back, back to this point I made before, you make a judgment about the quality of that evidence. You then aggregate it, which means you pull it together in some way, you apply it, and then you evaluate and look at the extent to which you've actually achieved your goals. And most importantly, this six-stage process actually is done both for the problem itself and also for the solution. So a tendency, I think, in lots of fields of practice, particularly in HR, is what some people call solutioneering. That is, you have an idea of a solution, which might be talent management or performance management, and then you somehow fit the problem onto that apparent solution or intervention. And this is a, usually quite a big mistake. It's always key is to start off with the problem you actually have. So evidence-based practice is really the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of, those, of different sources of evidence. Conscientious means you try, explicit means you actually write it down, you communicate the evidence you've got rather than just saying, I just know this won't work or I just know it will. Uh, and judicious again is making that judgment. So you, you make that kind of judgment around the evidence and in the case of evidence-based practice, there are four main sources of evidence. The first source of evidence is your own experience as a manager. Now, you may be thinking as an HR manager, well, I don't have evidence, I have experience, why does that count? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Firstly, your experience of a particular problem may be very good quality and very relevant evidence. It may also be very poor quality and very irrelevant evidence, but whatever, it's important you look at that evidence because like it or not, you will be using it. For example, as an HR manager, you may believe that poor performance is caused by terrible line managers, and that's a very strong belief of yours. If you believe that, you will tend to go and get evidence and data that confirms that point of view. So examining and making explicit evidence from your experience is very important for that reason as well. The second source of data in evidence-based practice, in the case of HR management, is organisational data. So that might be facts and figures, statistics and so on from your own organisation, maybe absence rates, maybe performance rates, maybe turnover of staff rates. That's data from your organisation, that's the second. The third area is stakeholders themselves. These are people like managers, employees, maybe customers, others who have a stake 
in the kinds of decisions you're going to make as an HR manager. Who's going to be influenced by that? What do they think about it? What are their values around what you're going to do? And again, this is partly important for practical reasons. If you're going to implement a solution, if those stakeholders actually don't like it and don't want it, it's probably not going to work. It's also important for ethical reasons. People may have values around the way we manage organisations, the way you should treat people, that mean you should listen to those, even if the evidence is telling you that a particular intervention might work. The fourth kind of area of evidence is scientific evidence. And this in general is something that HR, I would say many practitioners are not too good at. This is not particularly the practitioner's fault, this is often academics' fault. We produce research that is incomprehensible, sometimes irrelevant, and often very difficult to get out because it's locked up behind paywalls. But that's another import of evidence, source of evidence. Why, for example, should you implement a particular programme to manage performance without first saying, well, what, do we, what is the scientific evidence around what performance means, how you assess performance, how you measure performance, and what is the evidence about which kinds of interventions are most likely to improve or increase performance, if that's the problem you particularly have. So scientific evidence is the fourth. So in a way, these four sources are kind of like buckets, the things you go into to try and find out what the evidence is. There may be other sources as well, as well but in the context of HR, they're usually the main four sources. So, so far, all this sounds like it makes sense. Nobody would argue and say, no, no, I don't like evidence-based practice, we shouldn't do it, it makes no sense, it's silly. Nobody basically disagrees that it's a bad idea. So why doesn't it happen? And this is a key point, I think, for lots of practitioners, including HR practitioners, things get in the way. There's lots of things. I think the first thing that gets in the way are very strong beliefs people have about what's going on in their world. For example, uh, Mark Twain said, it ain't what you know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. In other words, having beliefs which are completely untrue can actually cause a lot of problems when it comes to making decisions. In the context of HR, for example, typical HR managers, and I've tested this a few times, often believe, for example, that the rate at which people change jobs has been increasing. But if you look, for example, at US and UK data, the evidence suggests the rate at which people change jobs or how long people stay in a job has not only remained about the same for the last 20 years, it's actually slightly increased. And again, another example of this is job satisfaction. People often believe that job satisfaction, again, in the last 15 to 20 years, has reduced. But in fact, again, if you look at the data, and this includes Norwegian data as well, actually, it has hardly changed for the last 15 or 20 years. So if you are a manager, an HR manager, and you have the assumption, for example, that people are trying to quit all the time and that people are very unhappy, you will take different kinds of actions to if you don't believe that. So exposing doing some of this myth-busting is an important part of evidence-based practice because those myths get in the way of actually seeking and finding out what might be going on. That's the first thing. The second thing that gets in the way, and there are many more I'm not going to talk about today, but the second thing that gets in the way is management fads and fashions. It seems to me, and it's true again of other fields, but HR is a field that is very, very full of fads and fashions. From things like emotional intelligence to certain aspects of management development, things like performance management, performance appraisals, ideas come in and out and in and out within HR. Apparently new ideas turn out to be old ideas, and old ideas that are rejected sometimes turn out to be quite good ideas in the long term. So one of the things HR has to do is be very careful that when a new idea comes along, like big data or data analytics, it's actually a useful and helpful idea as opposed to just the latest bright shiny thing that seems exciting and seems like a good idea. So again, fads and fashions are things that can get in the way of really taking an evidence-based approach. I think the third thing I'm going to talk about that gets in the way is power and politics. One of the main blockages, I think, to people using more evidence in organisations is it challenges traditional ways of thinking about power. If you're a very senior manager in an organisation, you probably got to be senior not by being such a great evidence-based manager or practitioner. You probably got to that position by being really good at politics. That means you know how to impress people, you say what people hire at wanting to hear, you're very ambitious to get ahead in the organisation, and what you're particularly good at is doing stuff, not necessarily doing stuff that works. So there's a related concept here as a quick fix, and many people have experience of working in organisations with managers who are promoted very rapidly, and indeed they do a lot of stuff. Is that stuff any good? Sometimes not so much. And they can leave a trail of destruction behind them, but nonetheless be promoted very quickly because they're very good at making things happen. 
evidence-based practice means you can challenge some of that behavior and say, why are we making that decision? Let's look at the evidence, what's going on. And in a way, it's nothing to do with status or authority. Potentially, anybody from any position, hierarchical position in the organization can challenge and say, well, what's the evidence for this? What's the question? So I think power and politics is something else that gets in the way. And there's lots of other, other things as well, including, for example, the training of HR professionals. Are they trained in an evidence-based way? And generally not. I think some management consultancies are very useful. I think some management consultancies are quite poor in this, in, in, in this context, as they do tend to promote and generate fads. So there's a whole range of things that get in the way. And it's important to think about those because evidence-based practice makes sense to most people. If we can think about what gets in the way, there's more chance of doing it. So finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what you as an individual or an organisation can do if you want to practice HR in a more evidence-based way. I think the first thing is healthy scepticism. I think it's very important in any professional activity to really question the, the information you're being given, whether that's a question that is from your, your line manager, whether it's from what your employees say, whether it's what a professor tells you. It doesn't really matter where it's from, but you should say, what, what does that mean? Can I trust it? Should I really believe it? Have they got some vested interest in telling me this particular piece of information or story? So being healthy sceptical is a starting point. I think another very good starting point for individuals and organisations is to encourage the use of the word or the question, why? Ask why. Why are we implementing this program? Why are we doing this thing? Why are we not doing this? What is the actual reason for this? And is that reason based on any explicit evidence we can actually have a discussion about and start to judge the quality of it? Or is it just somebody's pet idea? So asking why is very useful as well. I think also on an organisational level, I think there's lots of things teams of HR people can do. One is that whenever they're planning some new kind of intervention or they think they've identified a problem, is to go through the six steps I talked about and to actually go through the four sources of evidence. So for example, if you as an organisation feel you have a problem with absence, that your absence maybe is too high, you can do this for the problem. You can look at the organisational data, well, what is the absence problem? You can look at the scientific evidence, well, what does that say are the causes of absence and actually the most likely solutions? You can ask stakeholders what, why they think there may or may not be an absence problem. And you can also look at, as a, as a team, at your own professional expertise. Now, for any of those sources of evidence, there might be lots of evidence. It may be highly reliable. It may be highly relevant. It might be very, very unhelpful and not reliable at all. But nonetheless, going through that process is important, both in terms of identifying, in this case, an absence problem, and also identifying what the likely solutions are going to be. So you can literally sit in a team of people and actually discuss problems, discuss ideas, discuss things you'd like to do by going through that process. That's one way of doing it as a team. But I think more broadly, and this is both, I think, an individual and, and an HR issue, and indeed an issue for the whole profession, I think all of us, it, it, whatever profession we're in, and I'm in a profession too, I'm an academic, I'm an educator, I think it's very important to ask a fundamental question. Is it important or satisfying just to do things and to do stuff, or do you want to do what is more likely to get the results you want? If you want to do things that are more likely to get the results you want, it seems to me evidence-based practice and the frameworks that have been developed over the last 25 years are a very good place to start thinking about how you can be more effective as a professional and as an HR manager.